Hello everyone, my name is Pamela Hernandez and I welcome you to today's webinar, 10 Minute Public Transport for Mobility Needs Near and Far, which is the second installment in the series on access for babies, toddlers, and their caregivers. I just want to give a chance for more people to join before we begin. As we wait, feel free to introduce yourself in the chat and share your city and affiliation. Before we begin today's program, let me go over some brief housekeeping notes. We are offering simultaneous interpretations in Portuguese as well as in English, and listeners for those languages can access these audio channels at any point by clicking the globe icon at the bottom of the Zoom window and selecting the respective channel. On the mobile device, you can also access this function by clicking the More button. As always, the webinar is being recorded and will be available for viewing on our YouTube channel. During this session, we will be collecting questions for the Q&A portion with the panelists. So feel free to add those at any point into the Q&A box and you can use the chat box for remarks or insights. We will begin the official programming with a quick warm up. I am going to use I'm going to open a poll with a multiple choice question. What forms of transport do you use for your most essential needs? If you are a caregiver, that most likely would, would be around caregiving duties. Please add your answer and when I close the poll, you will be able to see the results. Please specify in the chat what other form of mobility you use. I will wait 15 seconds and we'll close the poll after. Now I'm about to close the poll. The majority of the audience said that they use walking as a form of mobility for their essential daily needs. Thank you so much for this input, which helps us transition to today's discussions on public transport for caregivers and their young children. This session is a part of a series based on the release of the Access for All report, exploring mobility constraints for babies, toddlers, and caregivers. The report presents key recommendations for better urban conditions discussions, the 10 minute public transport. Today's speakers will talk from the perspective of two cities, Istanbul, Turkey and Recife, Brazil to help illustrate the concepts with best practices and research findings. Today's discussion moderator will be Cecilia Vaca Jones, executive director of the Bernard Van Leer Foundation. The panelists will include Aimee Gauthier, the Chief Knowledge Officer of ITDP, who will present on the key recommendations of the 10-minute public transport. Next, we will hear from Beatriz Rodriguez, Senior Public Transport Coordinator at ITDP Brazil, who will talk about findings from the research on public transport serving care trips in Recife, Brazil. And finally, we will hear from Ilhan Akpulu, who is the Organizational Development Officer for the Public Transportation Directorate in Istanbul, Metropolitan Municipality. He will present on Istanbul's fair policy, which is helping facilitate care. I would like to invite Cecilia to open up with a few words before we dive into presentations. Thank you and good morning, everybody. I'm in Peru, so it's good morning for me. I guess that for many people, it's a good afternoon or a good evening. It's a great pleasure to be here today to moderate this great panel. And uh, as you probably know, the Bernard Van Leer Foundation has been working with ITDP trying to understand better which are some of the most important needs that caregivers and their families have when they have to move around any city around the world uh, in order to make sure that they're um, making a good use of their time, but also their 
using mobility as a, as a good excuse to connect with their children. So today I'm, I'm very happy to hear very practical experiences from Recife and Istanbul, two very interesting cities from my perspective. I've been able to visit both cities. So I'm very curious to see some of the experiences that Ilan and Beatriz will be sharing with us. And of course, Eme will give us a, a broader framework uh, just trying to understand better what are the things that we can do from the public transport uh, perspective that can really improve the way that we move and we navigate a city with our young children. So I'll stop there and um, thank you for joining us today and very welcome again. Great, um, so I'll begin with doing a, a brief overview and uh, bear with me as I try to share my screen. <laughs> it's always fun to do this. Um, all right, I think I did it. Sweet. Um, so good morning, uh, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Um, I think uh, it's been a really wonderful uh, time learning about uh, how the intersection of caregiving and babies and toddlers with our mobility systems. And so it's been um, great to work with public transport. Uh, it's one of my favorite uh, comments, uh, not comments, uh, uh, favorite modes of transport. So I wanted to start first by looking at what we mean by access. So if we're trying to improve access for babies, toddlers, and caregivers, what do we mean by access? And really it's about connecting people to their lives um, through the integration of both mobility and land use. And essentially that's, you know, how do I get to the places I need to go? So with that, um, we look at, sorry. Um, but what we're seeing in our cities is that there's a disconnect between land use and mobility. And this most visibly manifests on our streets, like in these two pictures, one in Fortaleza and one in Ichan. Both of these are new growth areas. And what you can see is that the buildings don't speak to the streets. The urban development is not related to the street at all. And this results in poor walking conditions um, distances that are too long to actually walk. There's no services nearby. Um, and then if you uh, zoom out, what you really see is that it's uh, increasing sprawl, single use development and more stress for people to move around their cities. So this is Mexico City on the left. The yellow, the light yellow center part of that uh, colorful mass is Mexico City. The lines you see there are the mass transit lines. Those lines do not extend into the high growth areas that you see in red dark red and orange. And what you see in those high growth areas are developments like you see on the right, which are single use um, uh, developments that are, are not really um, uh, livable for many people. So to, to recap, what are the needs of babies, toddlers and caregivers? Because they do have specific needs. So they have particular needs for services, things like healthcare, fresh food, uh, daycare and educational facilities, play uh, is really important because that's the building block of brain development. Um, they have needs for uh, uh, things like social services. So all of these are particular needs for babies and toddlers and their caregivers. They also have a need for healthy and safe environments and a good quality public realm. So what that means is it needs to uh, have clean air. It needs to have low stress from motor vehicles. Um, it needs to have actually space for a public realm so uh, young children can play in them, play in that area. And then finally, low stress environments that enable the loving and warm interactions between caregivers, babies, and toddlers, because that's going to be one of the, the key determinants of socio uh, emotional and cognitive development for babies and toddlers is that interaction they have with their caregivers and the interaction they have with their environment. So working with Bernard Van Leer, we developed this frame, these two frameworks that address those needs. Like if you really wanna address those needs. And that framework we discussed in a previous webinar that happened uh, about a month ago. Today, we're gonna go deep on the 10 minute public transport. Um, and before we start, just to talk a little bit about wh who do we mean by a caregiver? A caregiver can be a multitude of different identities. Um, it starts with gender. Most caregivers still um, are women, but it can be um, grandparents, it can be siblings, it can be mothers and fathers, it can be aunts and uncles. Um, so caregivers can be a range of different people. It starts with gender, 
but we really need to look at how race, income, ethnicity, age, uh, ability, all of these intersect to um, shape a person's experience um, in the streets, um, public transport, um, all of that's really important to consider. The other thing I just wanna note is that when we talk about public transport, we're also talking about the full spectrum of public transport. We're talking about intermediate public transport up to um, services that exist for public transport. And I thought it was interesting with the poll that if you add all the different pieces of public transport together, you get about 60%. Uh, so the, responded, the responses that came back were 60% of trips were made on public transport. That aligns with uh, women use public transport more than men. Um, and then the other one that came in second was walking at 47%. And those are the two main modes that caregivers use to, to, to do their caregiving trips um, predominantly in the research that we've seen. And then again, just to recap mobility characteristics of caregivers, because they travel differently than commuters. So commuters go from home to work and work to home. They follow the same route every day. They've memorized it. They probably know like exactly where to stand or where to get off or what time things come. There, there's no variability with the trip. With caregivers, they are often doing um, non-routine trips. They're going to to commercial districts. They tend to travel in off-peak hours um, and they tend to be traveling with others or carrying goods. And public transport has a lot of um, possibility for meeting the needs of caregivers um, as they're traveling. It's good for longer distances. Um, while the 15-minute neighborhood is the ideal, the reality is most of our neighborhoods do not have services nearby or do not have the needs nearby, so they have to travel for longer distances. It's also faster and more comfortable to travel on public transport when you're traveling with goods and with young family members because traveling with babies and toddlers may be slower, traveling with a full family may be slower. So if you can travel on public transport, that may be faster. Public transport could be an opportunity or would has the opportunity to increase interaction between the caregiver and young children. The caregiver is not paying attention to piloting or, or navigating of our director for South uh, Asia uh, with her child on, on a bus. So there's also this uh, issue around safety. And again, most caregivers are women and safety is a huge issue. So safety in public space, the feelings of personal security, whether they're in public space or public, public transport are gonna be really important but um, oftentimes the conditions of walking are, are unsafe. And so the using public transport is safer. And just a moment to talk about COVID and the crises we're seeing with care and with public transport. Coming uh, through COVID, uh, we saw the exposed fault lines in our systems. And two of these systems, our systems of care and our systems of public transport, um, I think were particularly illuminating. With care, what we saw is that more women <clears throat> left the workplace than men. And there's an equity angle too. So like in the US, more women left than men and most of those women were black and brown women. So there, there's equity implications around care that we need to be cognizant of. And then with Latin America, we saw that more women lost their jobs because of having the presence of children, school-aged children at home than men. And so care disproportionately affects different caregiving trips disproportionately disproportionately affect different people. But it's also, um, and our systems are not strong, they don't support care very much, and that includes public transport. So when we look at public transport, hold on, we see there are planning biases and assumptions within it, and public transport, again, the fault lines that were exposed from the pandemic are that the financial model for public transport um, relies on overcrowding, um, so this is a scene in Sao Paulo, but it relies on overcrowding. It relies on a private service recuperating all of their expenses through fair revenue, which may mean that the private operators do not uh, give service in uh, areas that are lower demand or off peak hours or on weekends. So the, the kind of financial uh, model that, un that undergirds public transport um, does not really support caregiving, but it's also commute focused. Uh, so it's looking at meeting the needs of the commuter. 
And as I mentioned, caregiving trips may be non-regular trips. So there's an increased need for things like ease of access and ease of information, but also caregivers traveling with young children have to navigate up steps or with their families in strollers carrying goods. These, this is how caregivers access public transport and public transport isn't set up to really make it easier for them. And then finally with public transport, we see a lot of places that don't actually have a space for waiting. Um, so people are waiting in the streets. We don't have shade or seating. Um, the, 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 the actual stops are not really nice places or conducive places for can deliver on uh, the needs of babies and toddlers and their caregivers. And the framework that we're using is the 10 minute public transport. And so it's where people have no more than a 10 minute wait for public transport within walking distance. And why this is important is it's about increasing the reliability, reducing the travel time and increasing the flexibility for caregivers. And it's 10 minute all day, all week. And I think that's the other really key component is like frequency is the foundation for service to work for people but it's also frequency during the entire day and then on weekends as well. So we developed some key principles for the 10 minute public transport and just to go through them, um, you know, to make public transport work better, a lot of, again, caregivers are time constrained. So reliability is a really key factor. So again, it's frequent all day, all week service. It's uh, doing things like dedicated bus lanes where the buses get out of mixed traffic and then they're, they're more reliable. But it's also having dedicated bottom right picture is just a picture of a sign on a door on the Cape Town BRT that shows <clears throat> where you can bring your stroller in, where there's space for strollers. Stations and stops are really important. Again, they're the, the visceral experience of the station where people wait. So you want to make sure there's ample space, that there's seating and shade, that it's weather protected. And I think the key thing um, here is also level boarding, because again, when you're carrying a child and carrying goods and then having to navigate up steps or get into a crowded vehicle, level boarding makes that much easier. So universal accessibility is important. But also when you think about station and stop design, you can think about it as civic architecture or civic places. So you want to include things that, that would help babies and toddlers, such as play elements and bright colors like you see on the left in Boa Vista and Lexington, Kentucky. But you also want to include things like green infrastructure, which is really important for cooling. Really critical for babies and toddlers um, and they're, they're more sensitive to air pollution. Um, safety and security is a really huge issue for women, um, uh, especially with gender violence and, and urban violence broadly. So um, having stations and systems that are safer and more secure is important. You can do that through lighting and station design. You can do that through things like in the top picture in Peshawar, Pakistan, they have closed circuit TV cameras on the vehicles. They did a great outreach effort with gender audits and, and bringing in women into the planning process to understand their concerns and really try to address them. Um, and then in the picture below uh, in Rio, you have transparent panes. So you can see inside and outside the station. You have, and then things like good lighting matter. Um, other protocols that you can have are things like uh, panic buttons, uh, ways to report crime, uh, training for staff on caregiver and gender needs. Trip chaining, or I don't know if I actually said that, but trip chaining is a really critical way that caregivers travel. Um, and so they make multiple stops throughout their journey. And so with uh, having a fair policy that allows free transfers, allows a caregiver to be able to make those multiple stops without incurring an additional penalty of, of cost on their trip. Um, having free fares for children, uh, having off board fare collection is really important so that you don't have to, again, negotiate getting into a vehicle with goods and children and also have to pay. Um, and then with service integration, I think this is this goes back to caregivers not uh, making the same trip every day. So information and wayfinding is really important. And because they may be going to non-commercial de uh, destinations, they, need, they may need to take multiple modes. So having that kind of service and information integration is really important. So I think that uh, that's it, um, just really broadly as an overview on 10-minute public transport. This is a moment in time when we're 
again, coming through uh, a bunch of different crises, probably about to get into some more crises with climate change. Uh, we still have to address equity in a, in a real and meaningful way. But 10 minute public transport can be super foundational for meeting, for delivering on those um, and delivering a dignified public service uh, for caregivers, babies and toddlers, and really changing this idea away from commute oriented to care oriented and, and moving that forward. So with that, I will pass it to Beatrice. Um, and there's more information about everything that I just talked about in the report that I think is already in the chat, but Beatrice, take it away. Thank you. Thank you, Amy. Uh, I think everybody can see my screen, right? Um, so I'm gonna keep, keep on moving here. Just having some difficulties. <laughs> okay, now, now it is. Uh, so hello, everyone. I hope uh, you and your loved ones are safe and helped during these times. I'd like to thank you uh, for inviting me here today to talk about this research in Recife, and it's always a pleasure to be talking about this topic and with great partners. So uh, I'm going to present the research that we did in Recife, that's in the northeast of Brazil. We have conducted this study aiming to understand the relationship between urban mobility and quality of life for early childhood. Uh, the research was done between 2019 and 2020 with the support of Bernard Van Leer uh, Foundation and the Recife Secretary of, Trans uh, of Planning and Management. So uh, we tried to understand three main, uh, our three main goals were understand the interests and needs of babies and their caregivers, especially the limitations and obstacles in their daily displacement uh, to understand and analyze the performance of public authorities and transportation uh, uh, operators, especially in relationship of these needs and interests of early childhood. And finally, to contribute to improve uh, the existing mobility infrastructure and the planning of early childhood, uh, of early childhood sensitive public uh, bus transport systems. So uh, for the identification of a study area to be uh, better analyzed in Recife, we have considered a couple of things like socioeconomic characteristics of and services for early childhood care, as Amy was explaining, uh, this is very important uh, to be Cross, uh, to have proximity with their uh, houses and places to live. Uh, the proximity also with arterial and express roads. So we have chosen the study area is in Morro da Conceição, uh, which is a neighborhood with surrounding areas uh, with a very dense population, with high concentration of low income population have several educational uh, facilities and health facilities as well uh, that provides family health care. Uh, and also is crossed by a, a very huge and essential road in Recife that it's called Avenida Norte. It's one of the main uh, traffic roads in of, the, of our study were uh, Morro da Conceição, residents of adjacent neighborhoods were also invited to join the focus group. And uh, the decision was based on the understanding that we need uh, the, the, these uh, caregivers from these neighborhoods uh, also benefit from local facilities and thus they, they, uh, their experience and perceptions would also have great value for our study. So what we did, uh, we did an analysis with a focus group research uh, survey. The analysis was mainly with caregivers from, of children from age to, uh, from zero to three years old, 
with uh, similar socioeconomic backgrounds. Uh, the interviews were done uh, from October to November. Uh, collected complementary data on the field. So we, we use walkability index and bus stop conditions, a methodology that was developed considering the infrastructure information and location on the sidewalks. Uh, this uh, complementary data was mainly to uh, collect the information that we have already gathered inside the focus group and trying to, to make it more technical. So I'm going to share, uh, to share uh, the next slide is going to have a lot of more information about this. And finally, we have conducted uh, semi-structured interviews with key actors from the uh, official uh, governments, uh, bus operators, to try to identify cross-cutting aspects of mobility and early childhood policy in Recife. So uh, the complementary data analysis foundation, so we have analyzed more than 150 road segments, uh, 38 crossings, and more than 300 establishments. Uh, we also have analyzed the stairs. So Mohu da Conceição is in, in, a, in an area that it's very, uh, that has a very irregular uh, field. So we have a lot of different uh, types of, uh, it's not a plain area. So uh, we have analyzed the stairs that comes from the uh, low area to the higher area of Morro da Conceição. And we have also analyzed the bus stops. So uh, the survey results and, and the recommendations, I'm going to talk about uh, a little bit uh, uh, after this. But uh, the methodology was mainly based on the walk walkability index, uh, also took into as well. And for the bus stops, uh, we have created a methodology based on uh, a couple of methodologies that already exist. So uh, we have created these four main uh, products in the first report, we address caregivers' view on the direct and indirect impacts of the quality of urban spaces in children's life and in relationship of their walking uh, mobility and the role of bus stops in their daily uh, trips. In the second report, we have uh, discussed and, and highlighted the obstacles and issues raised by caregivers regarding the bus systems as a whole, as well as opportunities and challenges of the government officials and the transport operations that we have uh, interviewed. Um, and finally, we have de developed an executive summary. The executive summary and the infographic are both uh, available in Portuguese and English. Uh, the executive summary have highlight, has highlights of the main uh, findings of the both reports and yes, has particularities and recommendations, especially for Recife, but uh, also have recommendations that every city can use and learn from it. And this infographic actually explains the relationship between early childhood and bus systems and set recommendations for a child-friendly bus system. So uh, the main results that we have found is that from the perspective of caregivers, when we are talking about mobility, uh, there are two different situations, uh, being with or without the children. When they are accompanied by the children, the difficulties are uh, heightened. The attention is double, in all the directions, the pace of the walk is slower when the children are already walking and the effort is redoubled by the weight of the babies. Uh, walking uh, through the neighborhood is reported as participating in an obstacle course. So uh, I think we take 20 minutes with the childhood, it takes one hour and a half, a person start 
is longer than a child. Uh, for you to walk with the child on the sidewalk, you either put in, in front of you and walk like that, or you you put in your arms because you can't. The side of the walk is too narrow. So sidewalks and streets are disputed with vehicles. It's on the sidewalks. Uh, the risks arise from the perception of traffic as chaotic and violent, uh, where drivers have a uh, excessive speed without respect of pedestrians crossing and exclusive bus lines. So we have complaints about quality of infrastructure for pedestrians, uh, although they recognize that uh, there was an increase in pedestrians crossing in the main avenues. They criticize the lack of signings and, and pedestrians crossing at the crossing. So uh, in general, the perspective of these caregivers was quite negative uh, when it comes to public transport, uh, transport as a whole, uh, especially talking about buses. So the capacity, the access to the bus stop, uh, the stop themselves are perceived as obstacles. So all lines are unsuitable for walking with a child. Uh, one chair or one, uh, a small chair to sit on that doesn't exist. We wait on the sidewalk and if it's too crowded, we will wait in the corner of the street and so on. Sometimes we are not even uh, on the sidewalk. We are on the streets waiting. Uh, so the service provided also presents a series of challenges, lack of real, real, reliability. <laughs> Uh, the vehicle's capacity uh, status, the impatient and, and sometimes aggressive and disrespectful drivers and so on. I think I may already told you about all of these things, so I'm not going to uh, spend much time on this. So dealing with all of these obstacles, caregivers understand that riding the bus means adapting their routines and planning ahead. So the, there are three factors that influence the decision on how the caregivers are going to move. The distance, the availability of resource uh, to pay for this transportation and whether or not they have the, the, their child with them. So the decisions are based on when routes are short, when they have no money, they walk. When they have a child, and or the journey is too long, they are going to use the public transport. Uh, so unlike the typical pattern of commuting from home to work, uh, caregivers move around uh, in these chain trips. So thank you, Amy, to explain the chain trips. Uh, although routine trips with the uh, children can be done on, by foot or uh, by bicycle caregivers, that do use the bus. So they use the bus to facilitate change. They to access more leisure uh, spaces, to avoid climbing uh, sl slopes and stairwells in hilly areas or un uneven terrains while carrying a child. So uh, I think the most important thing that we have found out on this research was that uh, most of the time when we talk about uh, caregivers and uh, early childhood, we are often talking about uh, pedestrians and sometimes uh, bicycles. But bus systems need to be uh, addressed most of the times as well because they are important for the caregivers. Uh, so the interests and needs of caregivers should be considered on all, all stages of designing a, a, a transport system, in the planning, the implementation, the operation. Uh, so if we are talking, we are talking about a complete, a full transport system integration. We are talking about physical integration by selling safe and comfortable physical connections between boarding areas from different lines or, or models of transportation. We are talking about fair integration to facilitate payments across different lines and especially 
uh, between uh, the relationship between uh, public transport and bicycles or, or bike share systems. Uh, we are talking about operational integration, coordinating and communicating different lines and modes in, in a complementary way. Uh, we need to address road priority. So dedicated and prioritized bus lanes. We need to address staff training. Uh, we need to have, for example, protocols to facilitate caregiver access to the system, standardized content and mandatory on how we interact with users, especially women, children, people with disabilities, or with reduced mobility. We need to talk about safe and comfortable boarding areas, uh, bus platforms at, at stops on the same level of the buses, incorporates playful elements, including color, textures, um, natural elements, and so on. And we need to talk about fleet adaptation as well. Uh, there is a, a correlationship between uh, how we are going to reduce our carbon emissions, especially in the public transport, and how this affects directly the, the life and the, uh, and the development of uh, a children, especially a child in the early, uh, early years. Uh, and finally, how we can applicate this in our policy. Um, uh, one of the people that we interviewed from the public sector, and they said, uh, initiatives cannot be just because this government wanted uh, or the other one wanted. You have to start this strategy in a well-determined way, contained within a law. Um, if there is to be a way, it's, it's assured. So uh, we need to have strengthening of technical knowledge, trainments of alignment of these concepts. We have to continue to have survey of caregivers percep perception. We have to have multidisciplinary and a very diverse team planning and, and monitoring this uh, public transport system. We have to have uh, specialized training for the technical team to monitor and manage the system. We have to consolidate in the uh, intersectional articulations uh, and understand the whole of each actor without losing this systemic view. We have to establish uh, spaces for dialogue and communication strategy and also we have to standardize uh, our exchanges. Uh, and finally, we have to ensure the, co the political continuity, continuity of initiatives. We have to communicate to the public population the social and economic benefits of these policies. We have to establish policies and plans that have clear guidelines, indicators, and targets. We have to uh, have availability uh, for a permanent and quali qualified technical team. So in order for our final, uh, our final uh, next step, mobility bicycle in early childhood workshops with the uh, technicals and managers from the public sector and operators from Recife, we have also uh, identify the main priority routes for implementing implementation extension of the uh, priority routes for buses based on uh, GPS and DTFS data. And then we have conducted, we are conducting capacity buildings with the public sectors and interactions with decision makers through our capacity building force, mobility campus. And for me, is that it? So I'm going to stop sharing my screen and ask Ayla to present. Hello, everyone. Happy to be here today. I will be talking about 
the public transportation system in Istanbul with our mother card case. Can I have the next slide, please? As you know, Istanbul is a unique city connecting Asia and Europe and Istanbul Metropolitan Uni Municipality is responsible for the entirety of that city. We're talking about a length of 165 kilometers. For that respect, we have quite long main arteries and we have a straight dividing city into two. Yes, it makes the city unique. However, it makes it quite challenging to organize public transport. We are also having the most populated, most busy seaways in these straits. The official population is 16, but daily population is reaching up to 20 million. And because of the straight, the transportation, the construction of tunnels and bridges are quite costly. Therefore, we have a relatively low share of sea transport. If you look at the, it's not a very flat city. Therefore, we do not have so many options such as bicycle or scooters. It is possible, but there are some challenges. Therefore, this type of modes of transportation are used in the coastal parts of Istanbul, but we are working to improve the number and the frequency of these modes of transportation, but they are usually used for pleasure. So there is 8 million trips daily in Istanbul. As you know, there are many different types of transport in Istanbul. We have buses in land transport, we have metro buses, they are also working on transit between two continents. We have minibuses and jitneys. These are quite unique to Istanbul. And we also have some shuttle services and taxis. We have islands. For the Prince Islands, we are using electric vehicles. There are no uh, diesel engine vehicles in the uh, uh, Prince Islands. We have the most number of railway construction in a city at the moment. So we have sea taxis and also we have vessels. Istanbul is also a peninsula, so it is our main priority to increase the share of sea transport. But because of different options between continents where we have the underground tunnels between two continents. There is a low potential of seaways. However, we are providing different options to make it more attractive for people. These are our types of fares. Istanbul card is the valid uh, transportation card in Istanbul. You can see which modes of transport can use Istanbul card. When we look at different types of Istanbul card, we have four different parts. Can you go to the next slide, please? There is one type, ordinary, that's the full price. And we have a discounted card. Teachers, students, and those citizens about the age of 60 can have We also have free of charge card. Those about 65 years old, war veterans, police officers, soldiers, national athletes, and mother, mothers are within that frame. Apart from the mother card, the others are mentioned by the law. They are free of charge because of the national laws, but mother cards is Mother card is a service provided by Istanbul uh, municipality for mothers. And we have a touristic card, which is also uh, helping them to find some locations. So let's focus more on mother card. Why we needed mother card. Contrib um, 
Turkey is behind many European countries with regard to participation, uh, participation of mothers to social life. And also compared to other countries. Therefore, we wanted to increase their participation in social life. We wanted to use more public transportation. And we also wanted to contribute their family budget, also reducing private vehicle use and reduce carbon emissions. So how we first started with Mother Card? Our mayor Ekrem Imamoğlu before the election promised that uh, public transportation free will be free of charge for mothers who have a child under four years of age. So all the expenses of this free transportation will be covered by the municipality. Can we go to the next slide, please? We had this decision by the councils of Istanbul Metropolitan Municipality, and we also have a transportation court to be approved by this coordination center. We decided to name this card Anne card. Anne means mother. And that's valid on integrated transport. Therefore, this uh, card can be used in any modes of transportation which can be used, which Istanbul card is being used, but taxis are exempted from this right. So they cannot use taxis and minibuses free of charge. Let's have a look at the next slide, the number of mother cards. There are 302,000 and more than 300,000. As you see, since 2020, around 50 million passes have been made by using mother card. And million Turkish liras have been paid to the operators of public transport. So that was the total contribution to the budgets of mothers. Let's have a look at the next slide. We have our mother card survey. We wanted to gauge the satisfaction and we wanted to analyze the use of this card. We have done this survey in uh, 2021 November. We asked them about their age, their profession, their monthly income. We asked them about them to, to what extent they are satisfied with the card. So we have, we have asked 18 questions. Let me give you the results of the survey in brief. Can we go to the next slide, please? The average age is 32. Their participation in labor force is quite low, as we have expected. Almost all of the users are satisfied with this mother card. That's 98 are owning a private car. And more than 85% of our users said that this card benefited their social life. In the next slide, you will see which mode of transport is preferred more by the holders of mother card. As you see these, it is bus. And the least way is seaways. And it is quite parallel with the use of Istanbul card. Can we go to the next slide? There will be an interview and maybe it will be more informative for you to understand the general picture. If we can play that with you. Yeah. When we want to travel in Istanbul, we used to hesitate because of the cost of traveling, but we feel free to use it now. It's very beneficial when you don't have enough money. You don't need to think about the cost. You can use your car. The mothers who have a child zero to four years old are being delivered to this car. It's a very good opportunity. I thought it would be wise to have it social. Of course, it's important. I sometimes take my child to hospital, do social activities and use public transportation. It's very beneficial. Life is very expensive. Life is very difficult with children. Instead of spending money for traveling, I can buy some food for my kids. Mother card makes easier for mothers. We are so glad we are traveling more compared to before mother 
other card. It's very yeah, useful for us. I'm able to use my card for even short distances, but I must go because of my children. It's very easy to have a mother card. You can apply for a mother card through anne.stamlikart.com website. I've heard about it, but I did not get it. I have two kids. One of them is a baby. I will get it very soon. You're also able to get your mother card from Closest Istanbul Card Application Center. I'm living in a senior district in Istanbul that is far from the city center. I have lots of traveling costs for to my relatives. Now I use this card so that free of charge. I think it is very beneficial, especially for mothers who are working and need to travel. Traveling costs sometimes is so expensive, even with kids. Mother cards. Thanks to Mother Card, it's not my, it is not a problem now. Yes. Let's have a look at the future of public transportation in Istanbul after some brief information about Mother Cards. As I have said before, we have some minibuses, which are very unique, very specific to Istanbul, but they are not integrated in public transportation systems. This, they are not integrated in the electronic payment system yet. Minibuses and GTAs, these can actually very essential to involve them to Istanbul Cards application and we want Mother Card to be available for using this mode of transportation. Next slide, please. Of course, we want to increase the number of shared systems. If you remember, we have the service shuttles. These service shuttles are carrying the students, the employees to schools and workplaces. We have many of them, like 66,000 of them. They're very important for uh, public transport, but they have a capacity of 16 people, but half of their seats are empty. So we have now developing an application called iService so that we can sell the empty seats in those service vehicles if they are going in the same destination. Also, we have a seat taxi uh, option. It is preferred a lot by our citizens. It is like a taxi in the sea, but we are also aiming to increase the share of maritime transport so that they can share those taxes. Next slide, please. We want to have a mobility as a service. We want to have a transportation assistance. That's an application. Thanks to this system, all, to, they will, all of the modes will be in one app. Railways, bus, metro buses, minibuses, jitneys, vessels, taxis, sea taxis, service bikes, scooters, park and rides. We want all of them to be in one app so that we can uh, sell personalized transportation packages to our people. That's all I have to say today. I just try to summarize Istanbul to my, uh, public transportation in 10 minutes. I hope it was beneficial. Thank you. Thank you all. It's been really interesting uh, and amazing. I, I really love the mother card, but also all the great data uh, that uh, Beatriz shared from the case of Recife and of course, all the broader framework that Eme shared with us. I We have very little time for questions and I think there's some interesting questions on the chat. So I'm, I'm just gonna ask our panelists uh, to cover one question, which I thought was uh, quite interesting. But before doing that, because we only have, uh, I think we have like uh, seven minutes, I, I do want to make some general remarks of what I All of the presentations really emphasize on the fact that we need to make services or mobility services accessible for caregivers. And we, we could see it through the pictures in all of the th different three presentations about how especially women who are taking responsibility on caregiving really need to feel safe and really need to, uh, to feel that the environment that they're uh, taking their children is also healthy for their well-being. 
But I also think it's really interesting to see that all three presentations emphasize on the fact that public transport can actually allow deep connections, but that there are some key factors that need to happen in order to make this uh, a, pos a real possibility. So first of all, that there's rea uh, reliability on, on the system, that people can actually uh, count on the system and know that the system is going to be on time, that there's dedicated space like bus stops that can really consider some of the needs that the families have. I think that one very interesting uh, integrating the different systems on, on the public transport. And I think this uh, is quite clear also on the last presentation of Ilan on, on really trying to incentivize uh, the way that uh, mothers and caregivers can access public transport. So before finishing this great webinar, I want to raise one very important question that I saw in the chat, which has to do with many of the cities, and especially cities in the south uh, of, the, of, of all continents, have to deal with the factor of heat. Um, so I wanted to ask uh, Ilan, Beatriz, and of course, Eme, have you heard of any solutions? And in the case of, uh, of Turkey, specifically in Istanbul, I know that probably uh, the heat is not as high as, as the case of, uh, of the person who raised the question in Qatar. Uh, but maybe Ilan, just deepening on, on your question about like bringing this kind of incentives like the mother card, uh, could you please share with us, uh, was this to do this or do you think there's also like a, a huge demand from people living in Istanbul on, on having this kind of benefits? And then for Beatriz and Eme, could you share some examples uh, that basically talk about bringing green and blue infrastructure into the city so they can also lower the temperatures or any examples and solutions that you've heard from a mobility perspective that can deal with this heat factor that was raised in the chat? So with this, uh, please, Ilan, maybe let's start with you first. Okay, thank you for the question. Of course, that was a promise by our mayor, but it is widely known in Turkey that women's participation in labor market and social life is very low, especially those women with kids, because we have some gender stereotypes in Turkey that it is women's task to take care of the children. It was a very nice touch by our mayor to provide that opportunity for mothers, to, for them to be more uh, mo mobile. We cannot really look at that, just the political decisions. There was a need, it has been, uh, a pro it has been noticed by the mayor and the number of mother cards are increasing every day. So both parts are happy about it. Perfect, Ilan. Beatriz, maybe let's go with you. Do, can you think of any specific solutions that deal with heat? Because, of course, there are many cities, including Recife, that have to deal with this as, a, as an important factor. This is one of the main uh, obstacles when we talk about cities like Recife and many cities in Brazil. And one thing that I want to highlight is, yes, of course, we can talk about putting trees and, and putting more greener areas uh, nearby the bus stops and, and, and uh, in cities, uh, especially in cities with, uh, in neighborhoods with informal areas and poor areas, we are uh, not having enough uh, space on the sidewalk to do that. So how we can uh, address this topic? I think the most important thing, if we are talking about public transport, in, is to talk about real, reliability. We need to have uh, confidence about the time that the bus is going to arrive not, uh, and not uh, have no idea what time it comes and, and go to the bus stops. The bus stop doesn't have any type of infrastructure that it's enough and comfortable to have the baby there with you in the sun or in the, the, the rainy day. Uh, so I think talking about reliability uh, and also about the infrastructure of the bus stops are the main aspects. 
Very good. Reliability, integration of the systems, and of course, thinking about the design that we can include when thinking about the bus stops. Eme, maybe let's close with you. And if you want to share with us uh, any other example that you think can deal with some of the effects of climate change that have to do with heat, that have to do with air quality as well. Yeah, I mean, I, I wish I had more specific examples, but uh, I will say like a lot of research shows that there's a, also, again, this equity lens that we need to apply when it comes to heat. And a lot of cities and poorer neighborhoods, they don't have the heat island um, uh, effect is more prominent in poorer areas. Uh, they tend to be less green. They tend to have less uh, green infrastructure, green trees. So there's a, there is something to be thinking about that. Um, and, I, and I think it's also gonna be a way to deal with extreme events weather events, including flooding. Like, so a lot of research has shown that the more trees you have, or the more um, And there are cities that are doing a lot of really good stuff around it. Um, a lot of people are thinking about bioswales, putting, putting in these like uh, rain gardens near uh, bus stops. Um, so there are ways to do that. Um, I do want to say that with shade and heat, though, there are other ways to think about it. So like one example is Phoenix, Arizona, their light rail system. They have their stations have a really interesting shade. It's a vertical shade. Um, so it's it allows you to stand in front or behind it, depending on where the sun is. It allows the wind to move through. So there are places that are already experiencing extreme heat that are finding creative solutions. Um, to their station designs, and, and we can start pulling those together and be more systematic about it. Well, thank you all. Uh, unfortunately, we are out of time, and there's some amazing questions. Ilan, people are asking how can they learn more about the app, and I'm sure there are different ways that we can just uh, continue to promote this transport just better for everyone, but especially for those who have uh, the biggest need. And I do think that caregivers, but especially caregivers uh, living in the most vulnerable areas are the ones that we should be paying more attention to. So thank you very much for joining our webinar today. And I hope we can meet again soon. Thank you. Thank you.